Amen. God is our all. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to the Gospel of Luke? Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 23, verses 26 to 43. Luke chapter 23, verses 26 to 43. And when you have it, would you please sit in front of standing to your feet. If you do not have your Bibles, we do have the words on the screen for you to follow along with us. Luke chapter 23, verses 26 to 43. I will read from the New Living Translation of the Scripture. They read as follows. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the day is coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with Jesus. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right one on, and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. Jesus saved others, they said. Let him save himself, if he is really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to Jesus, if you are king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving, us, saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then the second criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be, in, be with me in paradise. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated. Amen. The title of our sermon this morning is One Moment in Time. One Moment in Time. Well, today is the Resurrection Sunday. In fact, today is a day why we gather at all. For if it had not been for the sacrifice that Jesus made, and then God honoring the sacrifice early Sunday morning, we would have no purpose to come together. We would have no reason to dress up in our Easter best. We have no reason to get the fresh haircuts, to get the do done, get the nails done, to get ourselves prepared to look good for the Lord on this day. And we're here to celebrate that. We're here to celebrate all that God has done, all that God accomplished, all that God may happen on the cross some 2,000 plus years ago. And when we come together, we usually come together, we're expecting God to give us a sermon that from the beginning to the end makes us shout. We're looking for that sermon that's going to make us jump up and down. We're looking for that sermon that's going to celebrate the rolling away of the stone, the raising of Jesus from the dead, and the empty tomb. And I want to celebrate that with you as much as you do. But if all we're going to do is celebrate what happened on Sunday, we negate what occurred on Friday afternoon. Amen. Before you can get to a Sunday morning experience, you have to first go through a Friday tragedy. And on Friday, Jesus was crucified. He had been falsely arrested, accused of treason. 
Jesus had been heard preaching this gospel that the kingdom of God is at hand and that he is the leader of this kingdom. He is the king of this kingdom. And what happened, the Jewish religious leaders decided that if they could not make up a lie about Jesus, they would bring him down with the truth. And so what they did, they went to Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and they said, there's this man, there's this Jew, and he's committing treason against Caesar. And, you know, treason is when you uh, come against the sovereignty, when you when you do something that threatens the uh, uh, sovereign right of, an, of a ruling authority. And typically when you commit treason, the only punishment is death. In fact, do you know that in uh, the original constitution, in the original uh, uh, document, Document that sets up this uh, country that there's one crime where if you're found guilty of it, you are automatically put to death. And at that time, they took you out in front of a firing squad and shot you to your death. You know what that was? Treason. Treason is one of those things that is so uh, content, can, contagious, is so infectious that persons are afraid that if you let a treasoner live, the treasoner will multiply himself or herself, and then you have high mutiny within your government. And so when someone commits treason, they're sentenced to death. There's no life sentence, there's no parole, there's no halfway house, there's no probation, there's no community service, it is death. And so these Jewish leaders, they went to uh, the regional governor, Pontius Pilate, and they said, this man, this person from our own nation is inciting riots. He's trying to say that he is bigger than Caesar. He's bigger than the Roman Empire. You've got to do something. And so they arrested him based on his truth. In fact, I've had time, and this was another Sunday, I would tell you that your enemies, when they come from you, not, the lies are not going to be what's going to get them. It's going to be the truth. That they're going to use what you're actually doing against you. They're going to twist what you're doing. Yes, you may uh, go home and spend time with your husband and wife, and they're going to turn that thing into you don't want to be with anybody but your spouse. You may take your children to every kind of educational uh, program, every social activity. You may give them the best, and the best thing they're going to say is your concern is only about those in your house. Whatever is your truth is what person is going to come and get you. And, and, and use against you. Jesus' truth was that he was preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand and that he was the king in this kingdom. And so they, you know the story, they brought him to the conscious power. He questioned him. He said, I find no, no fault. I don't find a treason in this. They send him back. You know how your, your haters are when it doesn't work. They double down. He did it. Not only did it, but he said it right here with us. So they send him back. Pontius Pilate and, and, uh, uh, questions him, judges him, innocent. Sends him back to the Sanhedrin Council. Oh, this is just getting out of hand. Why won't Pontius Pilate find him guilty? Why won't he kill them? Because you are doing the deed yourself. You're hoping that Rome would put it into Jesus for you. That's why Pontius keeps sending him back to you, saying, I see an innocent man. And so what the Sanhedrin Council does, they go to Pontius Pilate and said, there's a tradition among the Jews that on the Passover, we agree to, if, if everyone agrees to be someone who's committed a crime. And so basically what the, what the Sanhedrin Council does, it says, let's put this to the vote of the people. Let's put Jesus out there with another criminal and see who Jesus, uh, who if they choose Jesus over the criminal. And now I know the story. It's Barabbas. Barabbas is a, is a murderer. He's a treasoner. He's, he, he, he's, a, he's a criminal of criminals. And you know what the people do? They choose Barabbas. They choose a criminal over a Christ. And that brings us to our scripture this morning because in our scripture this morning, we are at that place where we're watching Jesus be led from the detention hall, be led from the local prison to Golgotha, to the place of the skulls, to Calvary. We're watching this as he has been, he's been beaten all night. He's been lashed, he's been beaten, his body has been broken, it's been lacerated. He's bleeding, his eyes are swollen, his nose is broken, his lips are busted. He does not look like, like he normally would look. He looks like someone that has been locked away with eight, 800 pound men who have been beating him all night long. And he's brought out and they're leading him to 
uh, Calvary to Golgotha, to the place of the skulls where they're going to crucify him. And with him are two criminals. We're not told who they are. We're not giving their names. We're not giving where they're from. We're not giving what crimes they committed. We're not told not, no identifying information about them other than the fact that they are criminals. But we know by the fact that they're being put to death, it had to be something that was capital. You don't put people to death for stealing bread. You don't put people to death for smoking weed. Come on now, let's go. Come on, let's keep it real. I'm, I'm modernizing this. Amen. Y'all you, you should be ignoring more this. You don't, you don't put people to death for nonviolent felonies. You put people to death that have committed murder, felony murder, that have raped, that have harmed, that have taken life. I wish I, I wish I had a certain person who lives in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue sitting right here so I could educate him about who you, who you kill and who you don't. All right? That, that just like the Sanhedrin Council, they don't quite understand that just because you disagree doesn't mean your adversary should be put out, put out their misery. That you that uh, uh, the sign of a good a good arguer, some of a good advocate is that you can listen to your adversary, whatever your adversary is saying, and respond intelligently. But the Sanhedrin Council couldn't do that, and so they have had Jesus convicted, arrested, convicted, and now he's being led to be put to death. And he's going with these two criminals, and they, at one point he's raised up in between. The, what are these two criminals? He's in the middle, one's on his right, one on his left. In fact, this is where we get the three crosses, and you three crosses on the hill. The interesting thing is, many of us should take the three crosses down. There, if there's anything, we should only have one cross. We're not worshiping the two criminals on the side. Amen. Amen. Now, I know someone slipped, but you've been in Sunday school all your life, and you're going to come to me and say, Pastor, you know the three crosses are one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. Last time I checked, the Father and the Holy Ghost did not get on the cross. It was just Jesus. But we put the three crosses up there because we're commemorating what happened on at Calvary. But I want us for a moment to pause because we, we know the story. We're familiar with the story. In fact, if you go home tonight, depending on what child you're going to watch, you will watch the, the, the Passion of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Moses. You know how the uh, network TV channels show all the religious, quasi-religious movies on Easter Sunday. So you can go home and see the rest of the story for yourself. But I want us to pause for a second because something happens in this moment where Jesus is on the cross between these two criminals. That the criminal on his right side at one point turns to Jesus and says to Jesus, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Amen. Have we stopped to think about what happened to make this criminal ask Jesus with his dying breath for salvation? That's a request for salvation, that he's saying, Jesus, when God elevates you, when God puts the power of life and death in your hand, please extend life to me. Please bear me life. Yes, I have messed up. Yes, I have done things wrong. Yes, I am guilty of being a criminal. I earned it. I'm not even going to lie about it. But what I want you to do is when you come into your kingdom, please remember me. What happened? In that time that this criminal met Jesus, they've only been around each other for a few minutes because the scripture says that after they bring Jesus out, then they bring these other two criminals out. He hasn't had all night with Jesus. He didn't walk with Jesus. He wasn't a disciple of Jesus. He's only spent at the most 30 minutes with Jesus before he says, when you're in your kingdom, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. What has happened in that one moment. In fact, that's our title, One Moment in Time. In fact, we live in a society that says, if you're going to change, you got to go through a process. In fact, if you go to Barnes & Noble, there is a whole section of books on nothing but change. And what they do, they tell you change is a process that is a multi-step process. You know, the seven, the seven habits of highly effective people, the 12 steps in this, the 15 steps in that, the 22 step journey here. There is a process that starts and goes all the way to a finish. And this process happens over an expansion of time. In fact, these books, they all start the same way. If you're looking for a quick fix, please close the book because we don't have a quick fix for you. 
that if you want to change, you got to go through the process. In fact, I used to tend Weight Watcher when I was a fat boy. Amen. I still think I am a fat boy. I've been working on this weight. When I was a fat boy, I was at Weight Watcher. The first thing they told me is, you're not going to lose weight overnight. You didn't put on weight overnight. Don't expect to drop it overnight. I mean, when I was, went to Dave Ramsey, that's the same thing Dave Ramsey says. You didn't get into debt overnight. Don't expect to get out of debt overnight. In other words, change takes time. However, we see in the Bible at this particular instant that change took a moment. That in just one moment, change occurred. And we want to ask, what happened in that one moment that changed this man's perspective? Because if I use my sanctified imagination, I think when he first met Jesus, he's like the one on the left. The one on the left is saying, hey, aren't you the Messiah? And if you are the Messiah, save yourself and us. Bring us down from here. Use your magic. Use your power. I think he's like this one. However, something happens when he's not like this one. He's now... A Christian, and he wants God to save him, to grant him salvation. And what we're going to do today, we're going to look at what possibly could have happened in that one moment of time that changed this man. Now, I know someone is saying, wait a second, this is not the Easter sermon I wanted. Now, I want the Easter sermon where we're celebrating and we're shouting, we're running around because the stone, the grave, the, 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 the stone was rolled away from the grave. Well, guess what? There wasn't just a resurrection on Sunday. There was a resurrection on Friday. Because the word says, whoever believes in him shall not die. And those who die shall not stay there. They shall become alive again. And so what happened on Friday on that cross, in the midst of all this death, in the midst of all going on, life is being birthed right there on the cross. Don't ever think that when you're in your situation, you're in your predicaments, that your predicaments are just about death. Don't you ever think that just because it looks gloomy, that's all there is. Sometimes, many times, to birth, when it's time to birth life, it's never a pleasant problem. Process. In fact, ask any woman that's ever given birth. It's painful. There is a shedding of blood. That, that, that some of the women say things that they probably would never say any place else. That, 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 ask, ask any of the brothers out there. That every woman that has birthed my child has all looked at us and said, you did this to me. You made me like this. And accused us of doing something wrong to them. That, that moment is never a happy moment. It's only happy once we have the babies in our arms. And they're cooing and they're crying and they're starting to suckle. Then we forget all the mean, nasty things we said to the to the obstetrician gynecologist, to the nurse, to the anesthesiologist, to our husbands, to anyone else that's in the room. Then we but when we play amnesia and like, oh, this is the most beautiful experience I ever had, having a baby after the fact. But while we're going through it, it is not a pleasant experience. It's not fun, but it's necessary to birth life. And so here it is in this moment where it looks like death has happened, where it looks like gloom has happened, it looks like it's an end, God is birthing life. And the question we had to ask, what happened in that moment of time? Amen, give me my first point, amen. Amen, I'm not gonna hold you, amen. The criminal on Jesus' right witnessed Jesus' resolve to confront uh, the cross face of it. The criminal on Jesus' right witnessed Jesus' resolve to confront the cross face to face. face. You know, there is this belief that when you read the four Gospels, three out of the four Gospels present Jesus as this weakling, this suffering servant, and just like a sheep, like Isaiah says, a sheep that never raises his head, never says anything, just is led to slaughter. But when you go back and read those all four Gospels, including Matthew, Mark, Luke, the Synoptic God, three Synoptic Gospels, what you find, you don't find a Jesus that's weak. You don't find a Jesus that's quiet. You find a Jesus that's resolute. That he's unswerving. That he's unnerved by the situation. Here it is. Jesus knows he's going to meet his death. But Jesus is sitting there encouraging other people not to cry, not to mourn, that this ain't worth it. What you need to cry, what you need to mourn about, and what's going to happen when I'm gone, when I'm not here to save you anymore, when you have to stand on your own and have to deal with this on your own. That's what you need to cry. In fact, Jesus says to the women that are following him, the women that have financed his ministry, the women that have supported him, the women that have stuck with him, even when the brothers have turned and run. Y'all know that the brothers are not there, the disciples are somewhere high. 
fighting, but it's the sisters. This is why, brothers, I need you to come next week for, for Men's Day, because I need us to show that we're not like the knucklehead 12 men that ran at the first sign of trouble, the first sign of difficulty. These sisters were there. These sisters followed him. These sisters were even, in fact, here's the thing, to be associated with a criminal brings criminality upon you. I'm a lawyer. Let me go into it. It's called an accomplice. You can be an accomplice before the fact. You can be an accomplice during the fact. Or you can be an accomplice after the fact. And regardless of what stage of accomplice you uh, participate in, you get sentenced the same way as the one who's committing the crime. And so here are these women that have followed Jesus, that have been with Jesus, who are not afraid to follow him all the way to the place of the school. And they are with him, uh, with them, and they're mourning because in their minds, they think all hope is lost. They think all oh, hope is lost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they see their leader getting ready to die. They know no one comes off of the cross alive. They know the end. And they're upset. They're mourning. And Jesus turns around and says, do not mourn this. Do not cry. Do not be upset. In fact, you hold your head up. Because guess what? This is the start of the end. Because if I go to my father, I go to him so that he can send me back for the end. So he can send me back for the judgment. So he can send me back to get everyone that believes in me and follows me. Don't cry. This is necessary. In fact, the rest of them are trying to figure out how they can stop Jesus from moving forward. But Jesus moves forward with his case. He's got his broken body. He can barely walk. But he's moving forward. And he's saying, don't cry. His eyes are swollen shut. He said, don't cry for me. I'm, I'm good. This is what I've been called to do. Many of us, can I say this? I, I don't even want to say this. I've been wrestling all week. How should I say this? Uh, because I don't want anyone to get offended. But what I'm going to say, but then God says, offend them because you are talking for me. Amen. Say amen. We don't handle death very well. I know we try to prepare ourselves for it. In fact, we can know the date that death is coming. And when death gets here, we lose our minds. And it's just not the family members we leave behind. We don't handle death well. Well, we know we're going to die. We have lived a life of hell. We rose and raised hell all our lives. Then we get to the final days of our life, and now we want to be contrite. Now we want contrition. Now we want forgiveness. Now we're sitting here wondering about all the relationships that we could have could have had, and we messed over. Now we're sitting here talking about the opportunities we've blown, and if we could be just like Hezekiah and get seven more years. We are a mess. And then here it is. We don't prepare well for death. We don't write our wills. We don't do our uh, living trust. We don't do our uh, 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 irrevocable trust. We don't, we don't take any step. And then we got folks fighting over our old dungy, dingy, sweaty sweatshirt that we used to wear all the time that says Hampton. Y'all didn't think I was going to say some other colors, did y'all? Come on now. My first love is Hampton. Amen. I, 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 if I told my oldest one, my oldest one, for some, for some reason, my oldest one, my 16 year old, has become concerned about using her grandmothers. That my mom, her mother's grandmother, and another grandmother, she is concerned about losing them. And we've been having, I've been having to have to talk to her recently and help her understand that grandmas, all of them, were never meant to be here forever. I said, guess what? Before they were your grandmother, they were our mothers. I knew her longer than you did. And I don't want to see her go, but she's not meant to be here. At some point, she wants to go be with the Lord. She wants to be here forever. Who wants to be in there paying taxes, going to the doctor, dealing with crazy neighbors, you know, having to be on 77 in the evenings for three hours trying to go two hours? Who wants to be here forever? At some point, well, I told you, I said, at some point, daddy's going home. I said, as much as it's going to hurt, I don't want you to cry for daddy. Because guess what? Daddy knows who his savior is. In fact, that, this, this was a transition for me. In fact, if you look over the spirit, I'm sitting there with you in the room, looking like, Tommy, y'all better celebrate me. Y'all better have a, have a good old, you know, don't be sitting here crying. I, want, I told you, I want earth, wind, and fire. I want dad's man. I want cool in the game. And, and I want Angela Winbush. Amen. I want the four of them. 
they can put the choir together however they want to put it together. But I want them in here. I want y'all dancing and singing because that means if I have gone home, that means I have done everything God wants me to do and he has given me rest. We don't, this is why Paul says, Christians aren't afraid of death. Somehow we miss that chapter. We like to go over that in both Corinthians and the Romans. We don't want to stop there in that chapter because we don't like the idea of finality. Let's be for real. If they cancel them housewife shows tonight, someone will be upset. Because you don't want to see them housewife shows come to an end. I'm the same way with wrestling. If they cancel wrestling tonight right now, I'm turning this place upside down. Caress them out. Cause we don't, there's something we don't like with finality. Death brings finality. And we don't handle it well. What Jesus is showing us when he showed that criminal right there is that death could not stop him. That to God, death is not an enemy. Death is an agent. Death is what we take off all this, put all this corruptible and put on incorruptible. Death is when we take off what we look like and put on what Jesus is like. Death is how we get to heaven to be with God. I know all of us want the Enoch option. We want to be in God to come down with the chariot and get us and take us. But many of us ain't going to get the Enoch option. Many of us will have to go the same way that Jesus went. Through the grave and in through the grave to heaven. But you can't be scared. This man who had lived his life any old kind of way, who had committed crimes, who thought it not wrong to steal, thought it not wrong to kill, thought it not wrong to lie, has now realized that all those things did not lead to life, they lead to death, and that the only thing that can uh, change that is Jesus. And what he sees is while he's fretting over losing life, Jesus is resolved to confront death face to face. Give me my second point. Amen. Praise God. The criminal on Jesus' right observed how others verified that he was the Christ. Now, in the scripture, I know you see in the scripture when you read, when I read it, you read it along with me, you did not see the word verified. You did not see the word authenticized. You did not see the word authorized. You didn't see any of these words that give credibility to Jesus. But in fact, what you saw is the word mock or the word scoff or the word ridicule. It's the same. For us Christians, let me tell you why. Uh, how many people have been picked on growing up? Amen. Someone picked on you. Come on now. I'm not the only one that was picked on. Amen. Amen. My feet were real big and my body was real small. My ears were real big and my head was real small. But then my head caught up with my ears, but my head was bigger than the rest of my body. And so that was a running joke with folks that talk bad about your boy. Amen. Amen. And I my wife saw a picture of me from like kindergarten and she said, there's nothing but head in the picture. I said, the, 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 the cameraman that's focusing on me, there was body, they, they just, my hair was so big. And, and, and they, they picked on me, they ridiculed me. And the funny thing is, as I was young, I would be upset about it, that people were ridiculing me and telling me and picking on me. And it wasn't until I was spending time with my Uncle Harry. Y'all heard me talk about my brother and I would spend summers with my aunt and uncle in, the, in Florida. And I was with Uncle Harry. And Uncle Harry said to me once, he said, you know what, baby? People pick on you because they're upset that they're not you. I said, huh? He said, people pick on you because you have something they don't. And because you have something they don't, they want what you have, but in the process, they don't want you to appreciate what you have, so they want to minimize what you have so that you come down on their level and feel just like they do. That's why people pick on you. That's why they ridicule you. Come on, let me encourage some black folks in here. We are creators, okay? Uh, Copernicus didn't create anything. He's a thief, okay? Because you cannot tell me that a bunch of black people were able to build pyramids without machinery, without without the machinery that we think about, but they had machinery. They were at you to tell me they built a pyramid without trigonometry. The last time I thought check trigonometry was math of triangles. And not only did they do the, the trigonometry, but they had to use some physics because the last time I checked, each of those stones were way more than a ton. And when they chiseled them, they chiseled them so that when they took them to the place to put in place, that they didn't have to be hammered, they could be set down in place and they locked in place and they built these 
these pyramids that thousands of years later, we can still see them from space. You cannot tell me that Isaac Newton created something when we had it. Do you not know that Egypt had universities with libraries that are bigger than the Library of Congress right now? They had knowledge. They had information. We had it all, and that's just one civilization in Africa. There are other civilizations there. That's just the most famous one, because that's the one that Cleopatra pretended that she, I mean, let's tell her pretended she was Cleopatra. The truth is, we are creators. We are originators. And this is why people mock us and ridicule us, because they're not. Do you know that? What, what, what's a Revlon? Maybelline? What's the other ones of you? Savidal? Sassoon? You know, you know what I'm talking about. You go get your hair done, all the stuff you put in your hair. Do you know they are still trying to recreate beauty formulas that Egyptians used thousands of years ago? My wife is complaining this morning. She said, oh, the nail polish coming off my nail. Do you know Egyptians have fingernail polish that when they assumed mummies, the fingernail polish was still as fresh as it was thousands of years ago? And Maybelline can't make a, a fingernail polish that lasts for seven days? Oh, y'all will get this when you drive home, especially the sisters. Because when you start adding up how many times you go to the nail salon to get the nails done, and you think about how you could cut back on having them trips if the nail would, if this the nail polish would last longer. Come on, tell the truth, someone. Come on, brothers. Come on, brothers. They had ingenuity. We in there, I mean, more brothers spent their time on Saturday afternoons in the, in the garage, basically killing themselves trying to figure out how to fit something. And these folks had the ingenuity to to travel. They had the agriculture, science, all that. They had it. But yet we're supposed to be told that we, we're ridiculed and mocked and told that we can't be taught anything. That we aren't educatable. Is that the word? Is that word educatable? Okay. If it's not, go with me. Amen. If it's not, you just go with me. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, my mama, you said when she beat me. You know what I'm mama, that's not the right word. You know, baby. you know what the right word is. You just go with me. Be ridiculed. Being dehumanized, being beat down, is because other people wish they were us. And since they're not us, they don't want us to realize who us is, so that us don't be act like us need to act. Persons verify who you are and the mockery they give you. You know that old saying, every joke is 95% truth? It's that 5% is the presentation, how we give the truth. You know, I, I can tell you something, y'all get mad at me, I continue over the comedy zone tonight, DL hit me, say the same thing, and then you're laughing and, and having fun about it. Amen. Uh, every mockery is about truth. And here in the scripture, we see three groups of people that verify to the criminal on Jesus' right that Jesus is the Christ. The first group that mocks him, amen, uh, is the religious leaders. Now, I have an issue with them mocking him because if anyone did not have the right to mock him, it's them. Jesus is on the cross only because of them. They were so scared of Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus starts teaching, and Jesus provides freedom. Freedom in the sense that whatever was holding them back, whatever was keeping them ostracized and, I, and excluded from the community, Jesus was removing that so that they could become part of the community again. In fact, you do know that if you were born with a physical or mental defect during this time, you were considered under judgment from God. And that being under judgment of God meant that you had sinned or your parents had sinned. And, it, it, and here's the thing, the word of the Old Testament said that the sin is transmitted from one to the next. And so what they would do, if you were born uh, with a mental defect or a physical defect, they immediately took you and put you on the outskirts of the city. They isolated you, they kept, they, rec they, they excluded you. You were, you were not part of the community where here comes Jesus removing all ills, all problems. Here comes Jesus in this moment healing people, those persons that were born crippled, those persons that were born lame, those persons that were born blind, mute and deaf, those persons that had uh, leprosy, those persons that were possessed with demons, those persons that have been excluded. Here is Jesus coming and, uh, and, and providing freedom to, freedom to those, not only so that they can join, rejoin the community, community, but they can also join this new kingdom of God. And what uh, uh, the Sanhedrin Council, the Pharisees, the 
Sadducees or the scribes or the teachers of religious law understood was there were more broken people than they were healed. Because every time Jesus healed people, his kingdom got bigger and bigger and their authority and their power got smaller and smaller. And they were afraid if they didn't stop it immediately, they would have nothing. And so how dare they mock Jesus because they are the ones who put him up there. They put him up there. They did that to him. And here they are, they got nerve to challenge him. You saved others, save yourself. You don't have black folks again. Come on, tell the truth. You showed up Monday, said you can do all this by yourself. It's Thursday, why don't you get it done? You said you had it done on Friday. But well, how you gonna work it out? See, that's why you should have kept your mouth closed. Because if you kept your mouth closed, I would have helped you do it. But now, since you can do everything by yourself, don't do everything by yourself. Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They're really killing him. They want him to come down. They want they, they they are they are giving him a hard time because guess what? They realize that that brother has more power than they do. He has more power. But they're not the only ones really kill him. There's another group that really kills him. It's the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers at one point say, "If you're really a king, save yourself." Now here's the thing. Uh, Many of these Roman soldiers understood that they would never be Caesar. But every Roman servant aspired to be Caesar because Caesar was the most important person in their, in their, in their, in their in the empire, in their civilization, in their country. Caesar was so well thought of that persons assumed that Caesar was part God. That he was he was a child of Neptune or some other Roman god uh, that was there, and that he ruled because of his direct lineage to the gods. And so persons wanted to become Caesar because there upon that person was put the belief that they were a god that they be worshipped. And let's be for real, there's those of us that like when people lift us up. There's those of us that like when people give us our platitude. And, 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 and we we know them that we see them every day. Why didn't you say good morning to me? Why didn't you ask me to go? with you? Why did you ask this? Why did you do this with me? Why wasn't I given the invitation? That's because what they're saying to you. Why aren't you worshiping me? And here in all these Roman soldiers, citizens, they aspired to be a Caesar, but they knew not everyone that aspired to be Caesar was going to be Caesar. But here was Jesus saying, I am God. And when you see the Father, you see, when you see me, you see the Father. When you see the Father, you see me. Then not me and my Father are one. That here it is, I hold the power that my Father talks to me. He gives me the ability to do all these wonderful things. And so the Roman soldiers are saying, okay, you claim to declare to be a king? Show us. Prove us. And what really got my goat was the disrespect they showed Jesus. Okay? Uh, now, I ain't mad that they don't know Jewish scriptures. They're not Jews. I ain't mad they don't know the significance of the Jewish Messiah. They're not Jews. I am mad with the way they disrespected Jesus. During antiquity, when a king or a queen or a ruler came, subjects lined up to meet their king or queen. And when they lined up to meet their king or queen, they usually brought something to give the king or queen. Typically, most people did were poor. They didn't have enough money to provide a gift. So what they did, they brought the best wine that they were making in their cellars, in their closets, all right? I tell you, the king and queen, by the time they met all this such, was drunk. Because everyone was bringing them wine to drink. And what you did, you brought the best wine. You didn't bring out the Bulls Farm. You didn't bring out the MD 2020. You went and got, and got, got, no, let me tell myself, okay? No, no, I'm not telling myself. You went and got something that had B period, S period, O period, P period behind it, all right? You went and got the double barrel, the double age stuff, and you brought it to your ruler and you gave it. That was a sign of respect. A sign of disrespect was bringing them bad wine. This is why when, when, when Jesus turns the water to wine and the, uh, guests, uh, the guests come to the, to, the, to the host and says, why are you holding out on us? This wine is better than the wine you had. You were supposed to give us the best wine. They don't realize that Jesus made this wine. That's why it's so good. It is a sign of respect. So when they take the sponge, put it on the end of the, uh, the staff, and they hold it up to them to drink, this, that sour wine, that's disrespectful. That's mocking him. That's saying that you are really a king, you don't deserve my respect as a king, and nobody around us should respect you. But there's, there's a third person, a third group that disrespected Jesus. And that third group is not a group, it's a person. 
It's the criminal on Jesus' left side, okay? The criminal on Jesus' left side says, you're, so you're the Messiah, huh? Y'all know how we get So you're the Messiah, huh? And this is what I want you to do to prove it to me. Save yourself and us. Come on, y'all. It's one thing, you know, when we in trouble, when we in a predicament, it's one thing for God to get someone else that's in the same boat without. We want to get out of it, too. You know, as I can remember as a child, one of us get in trouble, we see one about to be part of it. Like, you going to pardon us, too? You going to let us go, too? Because no one wanted to be the one left holding the bag. And so this criminal over here says, if you're bringing the Messiah, save us. Come down, bring us all down. They want to see the magic trick. They want to see the, uh, the the performance. They want to see Jesus do what they've heard about him doing. Save them, they're ridiculing him. But what happens in that moment? The criminal on the right side of Jesus, Jesus realized that the only reason why these people are giving him that kind of hell must be because he's the Christ. You don't give someone this kind of hell if he ain't what he really is. Let's be for real. I grew up in the day and age where Magic, uh, Michael, Bird, Elijah One, Akeem, and all of them play. I don't know about these young boys. They play in street ball. I remember when these older cats played real ball. And what I will remember is that when they played ball and they would be playing against the Hornets, the Hornets would put four of their guys on the best team, the team, the person on the other team. In fact, they would rather let the other four guys be unchecked than to have this one good one. I remember when Michael came, it seemed like Michael had all 15 guys on the floor checking him, for they were so afraid that Michael was going to beat them by themselves. And, 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 and when you do that out of recognition that who you're against is, is causing you hell, you don't put all 15 guys on Bill Paxton. Those who are old enough to know who Bill Paxton is. You didn't put 15 guys on Bill Lanier, Lambeer. You put the 15 guys on, 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 on uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 the, he was a guard uh, for Detroit. Uh, Y'all know who I'm talking about. Isaiah Thomas. You put 15 guys on that crazy boy, Dennis Rodman. You put 15 guys on, on, on Bill Russell and, 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 and uh, 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 Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You didn't put them on uh, Kurt Rambis. Y'all know who Kurt Rambis is. Amen. Y'all remember who Kurt Rambis Kurt Ram Oh, amen. You don't put him on Kurt Rambis. And so what happened? This criminal right here on Jesus' right side understood that he's catching the hill exactly because of who he is. They're ridiculing. They're trying to demean who he is. And if they're putting this kind of effort into demeaning him, then maybe I need to pay attention. I told y'all before, I've learned in my life that when folks start talking bad about other folks, those are the folks I try to go get to know. Because there's something about those folks that are scaring and intimidating the rest of the folks that they don't want me to associate with them for fear that if I associate with them and they associate with me, we're going to be unstoppable. And you need to be able to recognize the same thing. When you're around people that are mocking someone, who are knocking someone down, who's talking about someone, ridiculing someone, you better be asking your question, asking yourself the question, what is going on? Why are they ridiculing? killing him so why are they mocking him so what is that, that the threat that he's causing and if he's that powerful maybe I need to associate myself with him or her rather than these folks over here. Cat Williams says all the time each year he expects you to be doing something different, something bigger, something greater and if you're not doing it then he's saying goodbye to you. That's my same thought. Each year you should be doing something greater, something bigger. If your haters hate you today they should hate you tomorrow. They should despise you tomorrow because you are letting God use you to a place that they don't even believe, don't even imagine. The verification, he, 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 Jesus is verified by the God over here, by all the people, by how they hate it. Give me the last point, then we go home. Amen. Got some special chocolate covered fried chicken for Easter. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Amen. With sprinkles all over. Amen. Y'all don't know chocolate covered fried chicken like this. Woo! Lord have mercy. The last one, the criminal on Jesus' is right observed Jesus' determination to have the Lord God Almighty extend forgiveness to the very persons mocking and killing him. See, this is where the rubber is going to be rolled for many of us. Because if you like me, you got one time to mess up with me. All right, you got one time to offend me. You got one time to cuss me out. You got one time not to give me my money back. You got one time to not show up for the date or the game or whatever. You got one time. 
And then, I, again, I, I told you I wanted to say for 10 minutes, I ain't like Jesus. I ain't Jesus to give you another opportunity. You got one time with me, okay? And so here it is when folks mess with me, you should hear my prayers. God, please control my tongue, control my anger, control my temper right now. Because, God, I'm about to ask you to release an artist of heaven on these folks right here. I want you to rain down hell, fire, and brimstone right now. Because I don't like it when you mess with me. Especially when I ain't done nothing to you. Now, if I've been messing with you, you mess back with me. I'll, I'll let you have that. But I tend to be a good guy. I tend to mind my own business. And he even come talking about my Chuck Tellers. I don't care how old my Chuck Tellers are. You leave me and my Chucks alone. Amen. But Jesus was being ridiculed. Jesus was being mocked. Jesus was being killed. And in that moment, the criminal on the right of Jesus saw Jesus do this. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Y'all don't know how powerful that prayer is. Let me tell you something. That prayer, I saw that prayer keep a young boy from the, from the chair. I was in court one day. And it wasn't my case. I was trying a, an armed robbery at the grocery store. When they were going to do the sentencing while my jury was out. So I was sitting there because you can't leave once the jury leaves because they could come back like that. I can take all day. So you have to stay in the courtroom or around the courtroom. So I was sitting there, and it just so happened that the at the time, a church member's son had been killed. And the facts were that he was leaving a party, and some guys that had attended the party had been watching him uh, as he get in the car, held him by gunpoint, forced him to get in the car to drive them out someplace. Once they were out someplace, they then beat him to death. I literally need to death. And with his dying record, this is what one of the, uh, the uh, co-defendants said in the interview when he was arrested. With his dying record, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And so that's what he said. So that information was shared with the mother because the judge gave the mother a chance to make a statement, or to even want to make a statement. So she got up. And I've never seen a, a stronger woman before because I go ahead and tell you I've got babies and I don't care if they get to be 102 years old. I, if you mess with them, I will put you 10 feet under the ground. Amen. Praise God. And all of us who have babies feel like that. I'm, I keep telling you, my mama's sitting back there right now. Y'all can talk about me if you want to. She's sitting back there all nice and polite right now. She's like the Tasmanian devil. You will regret you talking about her oldest baby. All right, but that, and, and my mom you said when you get older, have children, you'll feel the same way. And I do, and I understand now having kids how you feel about that. But this mother got up and she was talking uh, to uh, she was giving her statement. Her statement was to um, this one defendant, and he was actually was the one who pulled the trigger and killed her son. And this was powerful. And she said, "I want to hate you with all that's in within me. I want you to know that every." Day up to a certain point, I got up and I wish they would give me the gun and kill my son so I could kill you over and over and over again. And she went through how she was feeling. She said, but I don't feel that way anymore because I learned that right when you were about to kill my son, my son was praying for you, that God will forgive you for the sin you're going to do. And I said to God that if you, if my son could pray that God forgive you for taking him from me, then I have no reason why I can't pray because I belong to the same God he does. And that lets me know that my son did not die in vain. And she said, I hope that in your life you will come to know God and know him in the free parts of your sin. And then you can understand what my son was doing for you. My son was really protecting you as you was harming him. And I, when I sit back and look at this story right here where Jesus on the cross, they are dividing his clothes. They are splitting his clothes. They're betting, they're casting lots on how long it would take him to die. And whoever uh, won the lot will be able to take his clothes home. Whoever won the lot will be able to say they had the clothing of Jesus when they were ridiculing him and spitting on him and cussing him out and doing all this stuff to him. That he was sitting there saying to his father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You want to show me someone that loves, loves someone? Show me someone that's able to forgive someone when someone despitefully uses them. Show me 
see some of them able to ask God to bless them when they have tried to kill them. Kill them. Show me someone that is able to remind God of all the goodness about them. That's why it, it, that's why God requires us to forgive because the power of our forgiveness changes the story. I didn't get a chance to finish the story because this thing is getting good to me. I'm trying not to hoop here. I'm trying to get the story out. Jesus, let me get the story out right quick. So the judge is listening to the woman and I'm watching him listen to the, to the, to the woman speak and I'm notice he's writing stuff down. And usually judges don't write stuff down. Usually why the, the people are talking to judges are just listening. But he's writing stuff down. And so when the woman had finished speaking, she sat down. The judge asked her to miss her. Do y'all have anything to say? He really didn't have anything to say at that point because the power of the story was so powerful. He didn't want to mess it up because he realized that guess what? The one who, who should be advocating for his death gave him the best sentence of leniency. So the judge starts, he's looking down at his paper and said, I've been sitting here computing your uh, where you fall in the structure and guidelines, hoping and trying to find a way uh, to keep you from going to the chair because technically on the sentencing guidelines, you are called, you qualify for the chair immediately because this is uh, not only felony murder, but clearly y'all planned this, so this is a premeditated first degree murder. This is capital. He said, but after hearing her, after listening to her testimony, after listening to her story, after listening to the pain that she had to move through so that she could forgive you, I'm going to find a way to make sure you don't get the chair today. That while you deserve the chair, I'm gonna, if you got to spend the rest of your life in jail, that's where you're going to be. But you don't deserve death because that's too easy. That cheats this boy's death. That cheats what this woman has gone through. And so what I'm telling you right now is that he just as a woman said and hearing about her son saying, Father, begin and they know not what they do. You better thank God because it has changed me and it's keeping me from putting you on this chair. Let me tell you something. When you forgive others, when you exercise forgiveness, that is a thing that changes people because many people are just like me. They'll give you one time to mess up and once you mess up, you're going to catch the dick and you're going to get these hands, you're going to get these feet, you're going to get everything I can give you because you have messed up with me. But here's the thing. Thank God that Jesus does doesn't uh, live like we live, doesn't think like we think, and doesn't pray like we pray. That even when we mess up with one another, even when we break one another, even when we hurt one another, even when we cheat one another, even when we lie to one another, even when we steal from one another, even when we kill them in our minds, I know ain't none of y'all pull out no gun to kill nobody, but if I went through your mental roller deaths, I'm sure I've seen six million ways that this person can die within your brain. But every time you thought about killing them, God said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. I know someone may be saying, why do we have this sermon? Because here's the thing, before you can get to Sunday, before you can celebrate the stone being rolled away, before you can celebrate the cloth being folded up and laid on the end of the tomb, before you can celebrate uh, Mary Magdalene running into Jesus and thinking Jesus is a gardener, before you can celebrate that he is risen, that Christ Jesus is risen, you got to go by the cross. And when you go by the cross, you see that even as Jesus is dying, someone is getting life. I'm, someone's going to get this today. Now here's the thing. The celebration occurs at Golanda as well as it does at the empty tomb. And you need to know that as you are dying, and Paul says, oh, every day we're dying, every day we're being crucified, every day we're being slaughtered for your sake. But as we are being killed, as we are dying, as we are being slaughtered, God is using us to turn and change someone's mind like the criminal on the right side of Jesus. You may not know who it is. They may never say anything to you. They may never let you know. But you know this, that God is watching, that God is writing down and giving you the credit for it, that God is putting you in a place of remembrance so that when he calls your number, death does not become a grave. Death becomes a doorway. Someone go get this money as you're driving to work. And for some people, death is a grave. A grave is permanent. It's in the ground. But here's the thing for Christians. Death is a doorway. It's one way where we step out of something and into something else. It's where we leave something behind and go into something new. It's where we leave the world back here and we meet God up here. I'm trying to get you to understand this morning that God is doing an awesome, amazing thing. And just because you find yourself on a cross, just because you find yourself personal, Persecuted, just because you find yourself lied on, just because you find yourself beaten, just because you find yourself mistreated, does that mean God has forsaken you? Does that mean God has left you? In fact, God is saying, I'm about to get all the glory in the world on 
off your cross and I need you to get up there. I need you to be resolute. I need you to be faithful. I don't need you to be scared. I don't need you to be whimpering. I don't need you acting like a plum. I need you to put on your big boy pants and your big girl panties and I need you to get up there and I need you to deal with this because the more you deal with this, the more someone like the criminal is saved and his word is that all should be saved. Not one should be lost. That means the people you don't like. That means the people you don't care for. That means the people you don't even know. All should be saved. And God wants to make it happen through your one moment of time as you are bearing that cross. So now you can sing and jump. Because now you know the value of the cross. Now you know what was accomplished on the cross. Now you know what was paid for on the cross. Now you can jump and sing and I got joy down deep in my soul. You can see that now. Because now you saw that even in the moment of Jesus' last, he was still ministering. And if he can do it in his moment of last, what's our excuse? Why can't we do it in our moments of plenty? Amen, amen. This is what we're going to do. Amen. We're going to have Holy Communion.